Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Eckstein, um, who is joining us today to discuss her important new book, Cuban Privilege, Making, The Making of Immigrant Inequality in America. Um, Susan Eckstein is a professor in Boston University's Department of Sociology, as well as BU's Pardee School of Global Studies. And she's written numerous books and articles on the Mexican urban poor, on political economic developments in Cuba, on Cuban immigrants, on immigration policy, and on the impacts of Latin American re revolutions. Her books include The Immigrant Divide, How Cuban Americans Changed the U.S., Back from the Future, Cuba's, Cuba Under Castro, The Poverty of Revolution, State and Urban Poor in Mexico, and The Impact of Revolution, a comparative analysis of Mexico and Bolivia, um, in addition to many books that she has edited on, on Latin American social movements and social rights and on immigrant impacts in their homelands. Um, she's a recipient of fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, um, the American Council on Learned Societies, uh, the Ford Foundation, John Dee and Catherine MacArthur Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Tinker Foundation, and Christopher Reynolds Foundation. Um, she's received numerous awards for her publications. So, I mean, as, as, a, as a son of Cuban immigrants um, and a scholar of Cuban history, it's been enlightening, if also, for me personally, a little bit surreal um, experience reading Dr. Eckstein's book. Um, the book lays bare the policy debates and decisions that have shaped the lives of my entire family, explaining in clear prose the implications of the United States government's preferential treatment of Cuban migrants in the more than six decades since the Cuban Revolution took power while also highlighting the devastating double standards that led to repatriation, detention, and deportation so for so many other migrants um, from across the hemisphere. And like other Cubans, uh, my family received a host of benefits that were denied to other migrants. And in late 1967, my teenage mother, her, her two younger siblings, and her parents traveled from a tiny town in eastern Cuba to Varadero, where they caught a US-funded freedom flight to Miami. They went, then went on to Boston, where other family members had already settled. And thanks to federal policy that privileged Cuban migrants, they were immediately able to secure state welfare support that helped them pay for groceries um, and rent on their tiny one-bedroom apartment in Mission Hill. While my grandfather found work as a, as a shoeshine and janitor, eventually working for decades cleaning floors at Boston University Medical Center, um, <laughs> which back in the 70s allowed my uncle to go there for free. So we have a, a BU That's connection. <laughs> Um, in 1970, at the age of 19, my father and his close friend uh, fled Havana Bay in a makeshift raft that was made up of a couple of planks of wood, some rope, um, and an inflated tractor uh, truck inner tube. Nine days later, his raft was discovered by a merchant marine ship somewhere off the coast of, of Key West, and his childhood friend, still weak from his time in the Cuban prison, didn't survive the trip. But after receiving treatment in a Navy hospital, my father was processed in the, by the federally funded Cuban resettlement institution at La Casa de la Libertad. With the help of the US government, he received transportation to Boston, as well as housing support and help finding work. In the decades since, like so many other Cuban Americans, I've had numerous relatives that have been welcomed to the United States by the same government agencies that regularly detained and deported other migrants fleeing violence, natural disasters, poverty, and political authoritarianism. And it needs to be noted that, that U.S. Cold War policy in Latin America often added to the political violence, repression, and instability that led people to seek refuge in the United States. Nevertheless, my aunts and uncles that came during the 1980 Mariel Boatlift and my cousins that walked across the Mexican or Canadian border on foot were all immediately treated better than the Haitians or Mexicans or Salvadorans fleeing violence and poverty and seeking a home in the United States. Dr. Eckstein's latest book helps us understand both the causes and implications of this striking double standard, highlighting the combination of geopolitical, racist, and local level political dynamics that have until recently given Cubans exceptional privileges compared to other immigrants. Um, so I urge you all to pick up the book. Um, so please join me in, in welcoming Professor Susan Eckstein. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Um, my daughter, one of my daughters, actually went to Brown and loved it, of course, as every Brown student does. And, and she actually loved the Watson Institute, too. So I have my own little personal connection here. But that introduction was quite incredible. He's the book. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk to him. You don't have to read it. <laughs> Um, so uh, this, I, I'll just, I'm, I'm not sure, it may, I think it doesn't come through, it's not dark enough, but um, okay. So what you see here is, it's a fascinating picture for anybody who knows anything that's going on. This is downtown Havana, and what you are seeing is that people are 
getting ready to illegally come to the United States on a raft. And all these Cubans are watching it. So it, it was quite striking to me that, um, that it's so well known what people was doing. It wasn't something that secret, you know, that they were trying to come to the United States. I, I believe this was during um, the Clinton period when you had the so-called rafter crisis. Here's a rafter for you. So let me just quickly get going, um, and people should feel free, you know, to interrupt if you have particular questions or whatever. So here, I, I just, um, you really don't have, you can listen and not read it if you, if you want, but I'm, I'm just sort of saying that what the book is about is sort of to kind of get a better sense of how do you explain immigrant adaptation to the United States. A lot of the literature focuses on individual attributes, um, you know, education background, maybe race, etc. So that's sort of one a possible explanation. Another is the timing of entry in which uh, certain opportunities either are there or not there depending on when immigrants come. Uh, do you come during a recession or expansion, etc. And then the other is uh, the treatment that they get by the receiving government. Um, and I'm focusing on the United States. And in fact, uh, all too little, uh, at least the sociological literature of uh, immigration focuses on the role of the straight state and focuses much more on the role of the individual. So my argument has been that, in fact, the U.S. government has treated different immigrants groups differently and unequally. And fortunate for the Cubans, they have been privileged over other immigrant groups. Um, and um, the book actually sort of starts with a, a vignette of a boat arriving uh, with uh, predominantly Haitians. It was a Haitian boat originating from Haiti. And they very nicely pick up some Cubans whose um, raft or whatever um, capsized. So they very generously take them onto their boat to bring them to the United States. They get to the United States. The US take, welcomes the Cubans and, turn, and, and insists on the repatriation of the Haitians. And that really epitomizes a lot of the inequality in the treatment of uh, immigrant groups. And in my book, I do discuss Haitians as well as Cubans, but I do not pretend to have the same knowledge about Cuba. I have really, as, as he had mentioned, I've, I've written several books on Cuba, Cuban immigrants, et cetera. And so I'm building on a long history of understanding of Cuba, and I do not have my, my discussion of Haitians is, is predominantly secondary sources. But in the book, I do really trace it under different administrations, how Cubans and, and Haitians were treated dif differently. So um, I, I do f focus on periods uh, primarily since 1959, which is the year of the Cuban Revolution. And I do actually go into greater depth starting with 1980. Uh, and since then with the so-called Mariel immigrants who came, but I do discuss the period from 59 uh, to um, 1980 as well. And so I really try to look at what has happened under different administrations. And I started quite agnostically. I had not a clue where I was going with the book. I, I did remember sort of Elian Gonzalez. Those of you who are old enough might know in, in 2000, there was this little a Cuban boy, a six-year-old boy, who was like front page New York Times for about half a year. Uh, and the point was that he actually technically could have stayed here because he had landed in the United States, whereas another immigrant would have had no rights to stay. It became very controversial. His mother died on the boat coming to the, to the U.S., and his parents were divorced, separated, and his father was in Cuba and wanted to reclaim his son. So it became extremely controversial. Um, but that, so that was 2000. So you can see this is an ongoing issue about the role of Cubans. So um, what I will be doing is discussing some of the uh, unique, enti unique entitlements that Cubans have, have gotten. And um, I have essentially for those social scientists who want some analysis, I have a sort of path analysis to explain why it is that the Cubans uh, have continued for, so, so for over 50 years to be entitled to uh, benefits that other immigrants have not. 
So I'll get into that later on. So background, context, um, before 1965, or at least in the 20th century, the U.S. had an extremely racist immigration policy that um, uh, there was a, a 3% of a, a quota of immigrants from any one country, depending, this is in the 1920s U.S. law, that the, they used the 1890 census as a basis to allot the maximum number who could come in from any country. And why in the 20s do they use the, 19, the 1890 census rather than the 1920 census? Well, because between 1890 and the 1920, we had a lot of immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe who at that time were dark, quote, dark. And so if you go back and you use the 1890 census, most immigrants came from Northern, immigrant, uh, Northern Europe and essentially were white, Aryan, whatever. Um, so we had this racist policy it, it, it implicit, you know, it, it wasn't illegal, but it was designed to have this racial bias uh, to who we let in. Well, it was generally consensus built up that this was extremely racist, particularly Cold War, it, the U.S. was being held up as having, being so racist in their policies. So in 1965, the U.S. passes a new uh, immigration law that actually remains in effect to this day. Um, and what, what it did was to formally institute uh, family and skills as the main basis for uh, in, admission to the United States, not national origins, okay? Um, and it was so-called preference system to first family and, and skills. Well, it was um, that those were the criteria for all but Cubans. At the very announcement of the, uh, when it was enacted, uh, uh, President Johnson, it was a very well-crafted speech. I mean, I went through the Johnson files, where should it be, when should it be? So a lot went into the planning of where he was going to give this seminal speech, uh, uh, which was done in front of the uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, and which he, he says that from now on, people will be accepted, admitted on the basis of their merit and not from where they came. And then he finishes this speech and goes on, maybe he takes a breath and goes on to say, any Cuban may come. Any Cuban can come. It turned out, you know, you still had to go through some, you know, uh, uh, screening process, but the point was they were exempt from the uh, system that was being applied to all other immigrants in the world. So why? Stay tuned. Uh, so here I sort of, uh, I tried to synthesize the types of entitlements that Cubans have gotten over the years. So they've had special entry rights, special rights once they came and entered, um, even when they came without authorization, okay? Other immigrants without authorization are detained, deported, uh, or they stay under the ground, um, illegal, quote, illegal, and they have no rights, um, except, again, if you're Cuban. So then they also were um, entitled to refugee benefits, um, and um, we heard a little bit about the kind of, I think you were saying it with the refugee program that your parents were getting for some of your family. So uh, very explicitly Cubans uh, were getting refugee benefits and had the, the most generous refugee program in U.S. history. You did not have to meet the refugee criteria that any other refugee would have to meet, which is United Nations, it's international consensus, consensus somebody who has suffering persecution or has well-founded fears of persecution. In the case of Cubans, all you had to do was come to the United States after night, January 1st, 1959, the day essentially when uh, Castro comes to power, Batista flees, and so uh, they had their own definition of who a refugee was, and on that basis got rights that other refugee, real refugees uh, could not. Um, also, Cubans are the only uh, peoples who qualify for welfare um, uh, whether be, uh, for, uh, with the welfare right, uh, the welfare reform under Clinton. Um, an authorized immigrant has to wait five years before they qualify for, for welfare, and an unauthorized immigrant never qualifies for 
for welfare, except if you're Cuban. It is written in to the welfare reform that Cubans have automatic rights to welfare when they come. So another unique entitlement of the Cubans. And then um, there's also been extremely interesting um, effort to build up the Cubans as a, a political group on their own. And this was done primarily or um, under President Reagan. So you're seeing benefits are coming at different times. Johnson in the, in the mid-60s. And before that, you had the refugee program started by Eisenhower, expanded massively under Ken, uh, Kennedy. Um, and uh, Carter, I'll get back to, who tried to actually resist uh, giving them entitlements and claimed they literally said they were not re refugees and therefore did not qualify for refugee benefits, et cetera, and then went on to arrange for them to get the identical benefits to refugees. So uh, it, the, the, the list of presidents who have been uh, granting entitlements has gone on and on. Uh, but Re Reagan was particularly interesting. He courted the Cubans as uh, they were anti-communist. Uh, he wanted them for the wars in Central America to rely on the Cubans to help uh, covert, covert activity, et cetera. But at the same time as he wanted them for the covert activity, he really was courting them. And he, um, he arranged for them to, in a sense, become a political action committee uh, modeled after APAC. The, the most important ethnic lobbying group for the, um, the Jewish lobby, Israeli lobby. And so it was modeled after that. And they got federal money to build up their, the PAC. And, um, and then sort of the rest is history, because he helped create a domestic political base uh, for Cuban entitlements after that uh, continued after the Cold War when the foreign policy basis for the entitlements no longer justified uh, continued privileging um, of Cubans. So uh, so what were, I'm just briefly going to go over these. Um, I detail them in the book. Um, I guess Cambridge said I should show my book. So I'm dutiful so I can tell them, yes, I showed the book. Here's the book. You don't have to read it, just interview him. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I go into these in, in, in greater detail and other entitlements, so I'm just really singling out some of them. So one was airlifting of about a third of a million Cubans, um, and this would, was Kennedy, Eisenhower, and then a Johnson with this, when he said, any Cuban is welcome. He set up these airlifts that some of his family came on. You describe the freedom. These were called freedom flights. And um, so uh, about a quarter of a million came under these so-called freedom flights that Johnson set up. Um, secondly, they allowed Cubans to come in on tourist we the visas, which are much easier to get than immigration visas, um, even though they were known not to be tourists. Um, sometimes they were called refugee tourists, you know, I mean, kind of inventing new ways to justify allowing them to come in as tourists, and then they could stay. They were not cried to leave after three months or something on a tourist visa. They were able to use that as a springboard to, to stay in the country. Then, then the third point I make here, the paroling of Cubans is absolutely essential to understanding the Cuban experience. Paroling, I have no responsibility for these words, but the, the meaning of parole is very different in uh, immigration uh, than in criminology. And what in paroling, in, in immigration, what it means is you have temporary rights to stay, that you will, cannot be deported during that period. On the other hand, it's temporary. It does not entitle you to lawful permanent residency or citizenship, but it gives you certain security and you can work. Okay, so this has become the main way in which most Cubans have come in, including those so-called so um, freedom flights. A president does not have the right to give you a visa. That's only Congress has the right to issue visas. So, but what a pres president can parole people into the country because it's only giving temporary residency rights. And that's really the way most Cubans have gotten into this country. So, and this continued through, let's say, the case with Elian. Uh, it was the issue of getting paroled into the country 
And then at, with time, you could, within a year, then you could become, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, you could become a lawful per permanent resident, then five years later, and actually there were also fast track uh, citizenship for, for Cubans as well. So um, the wet foot, dry foot policy that some of you may about, know about, which was sort of coined under the, the uh, Clinton administration, it wasn't as new as it was made out to be. The wet foot part was new because that was the first time that Cubans were being rejected and sent back. So that meant if Cubans were picked up at sea, they would be sent back to Cuba. And it was part of an immigration agreement between the U.S. and Cuba. But the other part was if you touched U.S. soil, you would be entitled to parole uh, into the country. Okay, so that was the dry foot part. But as I said, it goes back to the paroling, really, that began with Eisenhower. So then the second really major, major entitlement of Cubans is the Cuban Adjustment Act, which was passed under President Johnson, and he used all his political skills to get that legislation passed. Uh, there had been early efforts under Kennedy and didn't, didn't succeed, and it was just, he, he was a master politician, and he really put those skills to work to get the Cuban Adjustment Act passed. What was amazing about this law, well, well first of all, what it does was allowed any Cuban who was here after one year uh, to, to become a lawful permanent resident, and then that meant if you're a lawful permanent resident in five years, you could become a citizen. There was no end date to this law. Lots of, typically, immigration laws have end dates. And I think Johnson knew what he was doing, and he, uh, he just le left it so there was no end date. And um, so it exists to this day. And it turns out it's not, it's not easy anymore to get legislation passed. It's even harder to get legislation revoked. And there's got to be enough interest um, to do it. And so the Cuban Adjustment Act, the CAA, uh, remains in effect. And this is just an entitlement no other immigrant group has. And so you come here without authorization. If you're here for a year, you can apply for, for, for adjustment of your status and become lawful. Um, so uh, then in 1994, part of the uh, migration agreement between Clinton and uh, Cuba was the U.S. Ag uh, agreed to a minimum number of Cubans who could come in any one year. For every other country, there's a maximum that's written into the immigration law. And with, with uh, the, the, this bilateral agreement, it has a minimum of 20,000 a year. Also, welfare, as I mentioned, unique to the Cubans that they come, they immediately qualify for, for uh, welfare. And uh, there were welfare benefits early, as I detected from what you were saying before the 1994 law. So that's, in a sense, building on, on welfare rights that Cubans had had before. Uh, then, miraculously, uh, presidents have invented uh, uh, categories to privilege the Cubans and to get around other constraints on, on immigration. And one of, one of the interesting ones was in 1980 under President Carter. President Carter actually tried to stop the, this mass migration of Cuba, it's known as the Mariel Exodus, uh, from the, Mar the port of Mariel in, in Cuba, in which uh, Cuban Americans sent boats, unauthorized, but they sent boats to Cuba. The Cuban government allowed it, and they came in to retrieve their relatives, et cetera. And, um, and so Carter tried to stop it. It was a, an election year. Uh, it, 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 the fact that he had no control of U.S. borders was a negative factor. So he was really trying to keep the Cubans from coming in, but failed. And so we had one of the largest migrations, and maybe I think to date, the, uh, to that date, the largest migration in any single year. So 125,000 Cubans uh, coming without authorization. And it even gets more complicated than that because uh, Castro took advantage of the opportunity to turn the whole Mariel Exodus, rather than shame these people want to leave Cuba, he dumped onto the boats criminals, mental patients, etc. so that Cuba's problems became U.S. problems, and it led to a lot of negative association of, of, with the, with the uh, Cuban immigrants who came that year. 
Um, but anyway, so Carter tried to stop this mass migration and failed. And so lo and behold, what he then does, he now then provides a basis for them to be here legally and to qualify for refugee benefits, even though he says they are not refugees. So he, they, they are entitled to uh, benefits as if they were refugees, according to um, a law that was passed in 1980. So it allowed him to say there, his ethical standard, these are, they do not meet the refugee definition. He had just earlier that year passed the uh, Refugee Act, which is our main refugee law to date. And the Cubans, the Mariels who were coming did not meet it. They were not inherently, uh, some of them might have, but the, mass, the majority were not a, 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 a fleeing persecution and didn't have claims to uh, real fear, uh, realistic fears that they would be uh, persecuted if they stayed. So anyway, as a consequence, the Mariels got uh, access to the United States. They did not get legal rights to stay because Cuba, uh, Carter insisted they were not refugees. So then comes President uh, Reagan, and he, he re, re uh, classifies the Mariels as refugees. And then that meant they could qualify for all sorts of entitlements, including uh, citizenship as ref refugees. Uh, uh, Clinton did something similar in 1994, because uh, he's, he's already worried about his reelection in 1996, doesn't want to have this uncontrolled migration. So he, uh, benefiting from the Mariel experience, tries to keep him out of the United States. Um, and so he sends them off to Guantanamo. And then what do you do with them once they're in Guantanamo, right? And they're rebelling. Uh, they, they were, you know, they're used to, Cubans were used to just being admitted. So they're protesting, et cetera. And so what he finally does is, you know, when the pressure, the media is away from the rafters who were coming in 1994, he reclassifies them now as Guantanamo entrants and on that basis, they're admitted to the United States, and then they are able to become lawful permanent residents and later citizens. So these invented categories are ways to continue to extend entitlements to Cubans. So I alluded to before, they were uh, admitted as refugees, even though, and with, as I said, the most generous uh, refugee entitlements of any immigrant group historically in the US, um, but they were really imagined refugees uh, because they did not meet the criteria, official criteria and internationally known criteria for refugee status. Um, the, the other thing, like to point nine, is they, got, they were exempt from the kind of immigration uh, restrictions that apply to other immigrant groups. So for example, other uh, lawful immigrants need to come into ports of entry, official ports of entry. Uh, there are certain ports that have that category. And if you don't come in through those ports, you are considered unauthorized immigrant. Um, and the other thing is that our preference system um, has certain criteria. I'm sorry, you can't say the, um, that, for example, you had to meet certain labor uh, criteria that you filled a demand in the United States so that there wouldn't be new comp competition for jobs. And there were a few other kinds of criteria. The Cubans were exempt from those. They could just come, OK? So again, um, and this continues through the 90s uh, that these kinds of exemptions from the immigration laws apply. So along comes President Obama. And he is, I, I, I'm going to say for now, I am here in, let's say, March. 2017, okay? January uh, 12th, uh, uh, 1917, this is uh, Obama's last full week in uh, office. He ends Cubans' right to parole. He, and he does some other, uh, ends some other entitlements too. Um, I talk about the, in the book about the medical professional parole program. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to talk about it, but you're w welcome to ask me questions if, if you want. Um, and, um, and so it seems like uh, Cuban immigration privileging as we knew it for half a century has ended. <laughs>
Yeah, um, so uh, he never ends all the entitlements, okay? So uh, some of the ones that are continued is this minimum of 20,000 immigrants, legal immigrants a year, uh, affect Cuban family reunification program, which was under uh, introduced under Bush II, and that allowed uh, Cubans to come in, a family in the United States could claim them to come in and be here that before they got their place in the queue, immigration queue to get into the country. So they kind of skipped ahead of everybody else to be able to get into, into the country. Um, and uh, so, and he also uh, kept the Cuban Adjustment Act in place, which meant that any Cuban who was here for a year and a day would be able to apply for lawful permanent residency with its path to citizenship. He kept that because he had no control over ca Congress. And it's also his last full week in office, but there's no way he could have gotten it uh, rescinded. So that important entitlement remained, and it, it, that actually has a lingering effect to the state. So in fact, um, so then comes Trump. And so, I mean, one, one of the interesting things is that these entitlements are uh, pan-partisan. They're, they're Republicans and Democrats that are doing it. So it's Obama, Democrat, then comes Trump, you know, who's wrote his claim to fame was anti-immigration. And he actually did not spare the Cubans, which was kind of interesting because, um, you know, he was allied with the, the Cubans in Miami. But at, at any rate, he had that consistency. And so what he did is he made it more difficult for Cubans to come. One thing he did was he closed the embassy in Havana, which made it very difficult to get a, uh, uh, a, a visa to get into the United States. So he really closed down lawful immigration. So even though he didn't end that bilateral agreement uh, that Clinton signed in, 20, in 1994 to have a, allow a minimum of 20,000 he just didn't honor the agreement, and the numbers got down to about 4,000 uh, being able to enter, enter, the, uh, enter the country. He also in, uh, admitted almost no Cubans as official refugees in accordance with the Refugee Act of 1980. So, and if that were not enough, he also increases deportations of Cubans and detention of Cubans. Well, it sounds like the Cubans are now, after half a century, being treated more like other immigrant groups. Well, that's why I say if I, well, that, that's not 2017, I'm now up to 2020, and it seems like I'm talking about history that uh, Cuban privileging has ended. But things, uh, uh, let me just go over some very interesting uh, exclusionary policies uh, towards Cubans and other immigrants that, that occurred. So one, what, what, what he did was he also outsourced and offshored immigration exclusion of Cubans and other immigrants. So uh, he relied heavily on Mexico. First, there was a metering system, which meant that um, at, at, uh, at border cities, they would limit the number of Cubans who would be admitted to the United States, and very few typically were admitted. And so that meant you couldn't come in to, to claim uh, rights to stay. Uh, and I should say, after uh, uh, President Obama ended the parole system, Cubans, and a lot of my book is on sort of society versus the state, not just state determination. And also, it becomes transnational, these societal forces. But uh, Cubans weren't taking no for an answer when they lost their parole rights. They found a new way to come into the United States, namely claiming asylum. And while we have a lot of uh, uh, people trying to claim asylum, especially from Central America, if you follow the issues in the press, but it, it turns out Cubans have a unique way to get around the constraint constraints that other asylum seekers face. So if you are, if you can get into the U.S., uh, it, it's very hard to get asylum in less, in less than a year. There's a lot of bureaucratic work behind it. So no problem if you're a Cuban. If you're here for a year and you haven't gotten asylum or your case hasn't come up, you go and you claim adjustment under the Cuban Adjustment Act. 
And so the rates of Cuban immigration, unauthorized immigration to the United States, are now soaring uh, way more, actually, than was the case when Obama put the policy, uh, restricted uh, the parole. So now there are almost 200, it's, it's, the, uh, the fiscal year hasn't ended, there are almost 200,000 Cubans coming in, unauthorized, claiming rights to asylum and basically getting it because their cases don't come up. So they're in a unique case. The others continue to be unauthorized to claim asylum until their cases come up. Um, and I think also when cases come up, the Cubans have a higher probability of being granted asylum. So the other thing that happened, and the U.S. is really relying on Mexico more and more, um, and it's, a, it's pushing Mexico to, to be the lackey and to do the work that the U.S. can't do, is not successful in doing. So it's got pressured Mexico now to start detaining and deporting Cubans that they had not done before, and increasing military assistance to Mexico, which actually uh, historically had a very, since the revolution, had a, a much weaker military than other Latin American countries, and now the U.S. is helping to build up the Cuban, the Mexican military to <coughs> not to fight foreign wars, but to fight immigration uh, to the United States. Uh, the other thing that the U.S. did, uh, and Trump in particular did, was to sign so-called so um, safe third country agreements with Central American countries. And what, what these agreements are is that, uh, uh, and most immigrants, uh, most unauthorized immigrants who've been coming to the United States um, since 1994 under Clinton when he put through the wet foot, dry foot policy, there's been a lot of policing by the U.S. Coast Guard of the Florida Straits. So it's become more and more difficult to immigrate by sea, even though it's 90, 90 miles away. And instead, what they're doing is they're drawing, joining this trek. Initially, it was from Ecuador. Now, it's, uh, Nicaragua is letting them in, so it's shortened the trek. But it is under horrific conditions. Um, they are robbed. They are raped. They are, uh, you know, it's just it, you would not wish it on anybody to have to suffer through what they go through to get here. But the main immigration now is by land. But sea immigration has also picked up despite this policing. I mean, Cubans, the Cuban economy is just gone, is, has tanked. And, um, and, and so by now, it's, it's a social movement, if you will, because most Cubans know people in the United States who can help them, help them adapt, help them find jobs, shelter, et cetera. And it's almost not even immigrating, just moving. The, the, the idea. So, I mean, people, Cubans are just trying to find, particularly the younger Cubans who see no future in Cuba, are just, it's a mass movement, I would argue, of uh, immigration at this point. And it's really society transnationally undermining state policies um, to Cubans' advantage, and then they get here and they continue to have this privileged entry that no other unauthorized immigrants have. So, Biden has really not done very much. He, in fact, he's been criticized for continuing the Trump policies. He sort of softened that a bit uh, more recently. Um, and he's opened, he's just recently has opened up the, um, the embassy in Cuba again so that now you can start applying for visas in Cuba. So he, he's trying to build up lawful immigration that, that Trump had really reigned in. Um, the, the lawful immigration has really not been more than 20,000. So that's the minimum that the U.S. agreed to accept, and it's more, more or less kept it at that category. Uh, so I think we, we will be seeing more lawful immigration, but I, I don't see a, a major change in policy, and I think most Cubans will be coming without authorization, which is witnessed by this horrific, horrific increase in immigration just every month. You, you know, when I look at the figures, they, they go up and up and up. So, um, in fact, here I said 79,000. Well, the most recent data that I, I was reading, including on the train coming here, was it's up to about 100,000 more, more than 100,000 more than that. So it's a massive increase. So, um, uh, 
I, th I think I've really elaborated on most of, of the things. Some of you who you're following immigration uh, policy and not specifically Cuban, you might be uh, concerned about uh, Title 42, which you may have read about in the papers, which was introduced by um, Trump um, un under the pandemic really using the pandemic as an excuse from keeping uh, immigrants from coming, saying for health reasons they won't be allowed into the country. And actually, it has not really been applied to Cubans. So again, informally, Cubans are getting entitlements uh, that, that others have not. So why? Why these entitlements, OK? And uh, I'll just uh, go very briefly. I, it begins as a Cold War policy that, you know, starting with Eisenhower, who was already building on his treatment of Hungarians, which was much smaller in scale, uh, he wants to welcome the Cubans and, and thinks, I think initially he assumed it was short-lived, that the Cubans then would go back and take over their country and, uh, well, history has shown otherwise, but it, so it begins as Cold War. And so the entitlements are one, to help the Cubans adjust and also to train them for the future Cuba. Uh, there's a lot of fantasy going on, but that was really what uh, comes out in the documents that, that I read. Uh, but the point is, this: well, if it is a Cold War policy, why doesn't it end with the Cold War? Well, it turns out that those very policies uh, created a new Cuban uh, my, uh, immigrant pool in the United States that had a vested interest in staying here, and they were educated here, they did well here, they had uh, uh, political entitlements, uh, you know, only legal uh, immigrants, for example, can vote. So the Cubans very early had political as well as economic and social entitlements that other immigrants did. Um, so the net effect of these earlier entitlements was to build up a domestic constituency among the Cuban Americans themselves to press for the continued privileging of Cubans. And there are different kind of pillars of that. One is the vote. Second is the fact that they happen, related to that, they happen to settle in the largest so-called swing state of Florida. Uh, and then the uh, number of votes, uh, electoral college votes, uh, in 1960 was 10. And now it's, I think, 29, and I think it's, it's supposed to go up, I think, uh, uh, shortly. So this is a massive increase in importance of Florida in national politics. And since it's a supposedly a swing state, neither Democratic candidates nor the Republican ones write the Cubans off. And so they each are trying to court the Cuban vote and give them entitlements so that to, to win over their votes. So it is what I call sort of path dependent. And uh, in line with that argument, I also try, I show in the book that when there were efforts to, to deny entitlements to the Cubans, um, it didn't last. So like Carter really tried to end it and he wound up extending new entitlements into more Cubans. And, um, and then, uh, oh, the other thing is uh, politicians. So Cuban Americans uh, started getting elected to not only local but national office. And they basically have a lobby in Congress, uh, a block in Congress that's crossed partisan lines. Um, Senator Menendez from uh, New Jersey on any issue of Cuba writes votes with the Republican Cuban Americans from Florida. So it's a, a Cuban-American bloc that is, in a sense, across partisan lines. Um, so then there's the issue of race, which is always you know, a, sort of a hard one to see. But I think there's no question that uh, race is part of the story that if we don't know, we, can't, we don't have a good control class, that if, if the Cubans had been um, uh, Afro-Cubans and have been black, and they are Afro-Cubans in Cuba, but they weren't the ones who were coming, that they might have been treated differently. We don't know. We do have the case of Haitians coming at the same time, and they were treated totally differently. Now, during the Cold War, the argument could be made that um, the president of Haiti was uh, allied with the United States, and uh, unlike you know Castro aligning with the Soviet Union, well, that argument falls apart in the, the post-Cold War because the, the, there's no more reason for uh, singling Cubans out for special treatment uh, for, for, 
for those kinds of political reasons. So there is racism, uh, latent if not explicit, that helps explain the, why the Cubans were so privileged. Um, and I've already discussed it. I want to go on and give you, um, I, I think for purposes of time, why don't I stop here? Um, and this is the past part, dependent argument that I've been talking about as we went along uh, that helps explain why the continued privileging of Cubans. So I'll stop there. Um, I, uh, criticisms, questions, everybody had. <laughs> Microphones. I know that uh, we have uh, folks also at home uh, on Zoom that might have questions as well. So there's someone monitoring that for us. Um. Thank you very much for your talk. Would you be able to tell us what was uh, Barry Goldwater's and William F. Buckley Jr.'s position on Cuba? Um, you know, my short answer is I don't know, okay? <laughs> Maybe I should just stop at that, but they, they were cold warriors, so they would, be, even though I, I can't quote you specific things that Goldwater, for example, said, it would be totally consistent for them to uh, want to welcome these anti-communists into this country. So Kennedy did it. You know, I, I don't know specifically about Goldwater. Uh, I mean, he did win, but I don't think there was opposition to privileging the Cubans in the context of the Cold War. It became very difficult because actually, in, in a sense of the talk, that there's resentment among the Af African Americans in Miami to letting all these new Cubans into the country, taking the jobs away from them, et cetera. But it was a hard thing to, to sell in, in the Cold War, um, that in some sense, you know, the, the African-American leaders were very polite about the whole issue of the refugees. So I just have to imagine, and you may have a particular reason for ans asking, but I, I, and this was not an era where there was that, that much immigration in general, where now, let's say, you have Republicans who are really anti-immigration. It was a different time. It was still before the 1965 Immigration Act, so most immigrants really were from from Europe. So I don't know if you had a particular reason for asking. Only in terms of popular sentiment, because I was younger in that era, but I don't remember, remember any television programs like Face to Face the Nation or whatever, uh -huh. where they really kind of discussed this particular issue through, and that's why I was asking. Uh -huh. You do not remember. I don't remember. Yeah, I think the idea, the anti-communism just took over everything. Um, but interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for this really enlightening talk. So I, was, I have a two-part question. First part is like, so what can you tell us about Cuban Americans overall, so construction of this particular policy, number one? And number two, besides the fact that we get wonderful colleagues like Danielle here, what is the <laughs> overall effect of this policy on the rest of us in America? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So wait, remind me of the first question again. It's just a broader question about Cuban Americans as an entity. Uh, so OK. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I did write the uh, book, uh, The Immigrant Divide, uh, which talks about the Cuban-American community and the changes in the Cuban-American community. So I really differentiate between the immigrants who came, uh, particularly that first wave that came, but those who came during the Cold War and in the post-Cold War, they really differ in many respects in terms of social class, uh, slightly in terms of race, um, but their mentality is very different. They grew up in very different Cubas. So the first ones that came, you know, were, they knew Cuba before the revolution and many, because it was a class exodus, they did well. You know, they had their clubs and it was a, it was a nice lifestyle for them. So they, you know, resent that loss that they got and they, when, in coming here, define themselves as exiles. 
but they weren't, it wasn't so much, per, for most of them, there certainly is persecution, but for most of them they were coming initially because they were scared that they were losing things and I think maybe expected the worst politically and some of them, you know, were, no question, were imprisoned many, some of them even for decades. Um, so there is a span of how Cubans have been treated uh, in Cuba trying to leave. Um, but in, in general, you have this difference between those cohorts of Cuban Americans, and they've had very different experiences in the United States. And though you have, just as his family illustrates, you do have families that span these, these different waves of immigration. In, in general, uh, the first ones, you know, their families have reunited in the country, in the United States by now and don't have that much to do with the newer Cubans, except maybe as landscapers or nannies or things like people who clean their houses. So, they're, and it's partly social class. You know, they just, they, they grew up in different worlds and their views towards Cuba are totally different. Uh, the first ones have a, a personal embargo that they themselves have imposed, it's not in law. Uh, Thou shalt not return to Cuba, it used to be Thou shalt not re return to Cuba under Castro. Well, you know, they've kind of had to tweak that because they went through Fidel, they went through Raul, and now they have a, a non-Castro head of state. Um, but they have their, their own morality, okay? Um, and it's very different than the morality of the new immigrants, which is much more family-based. And they, the new Cubans, want to travel to Cuba, send remittances. And these are all things that the earlier immigrants don't want because they see it as helping Cuba. Uh, and the Trump administration really cracked down both on visits and on sending remittances, which is in a sense backfiring on the United States. The more we restrict uh, opportunities in Cuba, the more Cubans are gonna want to immigrate because the opportunities in Cuba really have collapsed. So, uh, it really works against U.S. interests, and the U.S. government may not like the Cuban government, but sometimes you have to learn to work, live to work with your enemy because the, by not doing it, you're going to create more problems with yourself. There's sort of a need for a real politique rather than sort of a moral moral politique, which might say you know squeeze the Cuban government more and more. It's been squeezed almost every possible way. Um, and then COVID doesn't help, right? It really led to the contraction of the tourist industry, which has been the main source of uh, hard currency uh, in, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, you know, Cuba is between a rock and a hard place. And um, so what that affects the immigrants who come. So they really, there are differences within the Cuban American community that are significant, but the first wave, uh, become the political class in Miami. They are, are wealthy. Uh, on average, they do better than um, Americans, native, native, including native-born Americans. I actually, I, if you wanted, I could uh, pull, pull up a table on that. So they've done well in America. So uh, even though they came here to, you know, be, to escape uh, the Cuban Revolution, very quickly, they came to do well in America, and then they have families here and stay. So politically, economically, and they become a, sort of the cultural force of Miami. They've turned Miami into what's been dubbed the, the northernmost Latin American city. That, you know, you can get off, I mean, if I go to Miami, I feel like I'm in Latin America, right? You can speak Spanish, you know. It, um, and the Cubans were absolutely central to, to that transformation. They're not alone, but they are the dominant force in, uh, in Miami, uh, which is uh, the hub of Havana, USA, as they say. And your second question is, how are they do, no, how? It's, it's, it's a longer question. Yeah, it's hard. It, actually, that was my real emphasis, like, well, these policies, right? So how does that affect the rest of us? So you're like, access to the industry. Impact is pretty small, but another question, right, here around what kind of time. Okay. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, two sort of quick questions. One, have you observed any sizable movements of Cuban Americans moving back to Cuba on their own volition at any point post-revolution? And two, um, sort of similar on the idea of Cuban Americans' political formations when they sort of cement themselves here. 
do you see perhaps in the younger generation, which in, you know, more broadly is more sympathetic to ideas of Marxism, socialism, et cetera, do you see any trends of like positive perceptions of the current Cuban government among any sort of pocket of Cuban American populations? Right, in terms of reverse migration, minimal. Uh, and there have been some political figures who went back. And one, one um, escape, his name is escaping me right now, but he had been in prison in Cuba for 20 years, was let out, came to the U.S., and actually returned to Cuba. And, you know, I think he, he went back, obviously, because he thought he had better political prospects in, in Cuba. But, you know, by now, it's, life in Cuba is really hard. Um, it's hard to make money. It's hard to get goods, uh, huge lines, um, blackouts. It's, it's not something that's going to drive people to reverse migration. I, you know, maybe if, if when opportunities do open up, you have to assume maybe at some time they will, then you might see some going back. Some who may, you know, thought they were coming to the United States, the streets are paved with gold, and they're finding you know, it's very expensive living in the United States and things like that. So uh, you can imagine some going back, and particularly, I mean, for different reasons, but the, the new immigrants, I don't think they're that tied down uh, to the United States, first of all, they're young and they don't have families here yet that would tie them to the United States. So if they saw better opportunities, they might go, best, uh, go back. I mean, it's become very fluid among the new immigrants. You know, I, when I talk to some of them, they say they come to Miami and they see people from their grade school and from their high school and from their workplace, et cetera. It's, you know, it, it makes the, the move very easy, in a sense. It's not this dramatic immigration move. You're just almost relocating. So I could imagine if they saw better opportunities in Cuba, um, they would return. I, I'm, I'm not too high about it. So and then, you know, there are some splits within the Cuban-American community, for sure. Um, it is, the Cuban politics is dominated by the earliest wave of Cuban immigrants and their children. So, you know, we have a new generation, U.S. born, but they are their parents' children. And so, yes, they, you know, they're exposed to U.S. media, to U.S. schools, you know, particularly those who stay in Miami, go to school, college in Miami, and they're living in that Miami, Cuban-American, exile-dominated environment. And so, you know, maybe a different shade of gray, if you will, or different, um, but, you know, they, they see their future still tied with, you know, obviously with some exceptions. And, you know, there have been some Cuban-American Democrats who've tried to take a, a more open stand on relations with, with uh, Cuba, and they haven't gotten very far, frankly. They've sort of withered away when I think of some of the ones, who, Republican or Democrat, who have done that. Um, Marxism is pretty dead. Um, I have not, as I focused, you know, this, this book really took me to the U.S. side. I'd never done, I learned more about U.S. government <laughs> through writing this book, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, so this is really, you know, I shifted to the U.S. To, in, in, but building on all the work I'd done on Cuba, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, there's just, I saw, my point was I don't read the Cuban newspapers the way I used to. But the thing is, reading Cuban newspapers are sort of a torture. <laughs> you have to look pretty hard to find a fact. Well, when I was writing like my book on Cuba, okay, I did that. I looked for a fact here, I looked for a fact there. But there, the, the ideology has changed, I think, but I can't say that I studied because I really had, I have not had to, to read the paper lately, but it, it started to shift when I still was reading it. Much more increasing focus on a, a nationalism and heritage of, you know, the Cuban heroes of independence, et cetera. So that's really what's being played up as nationalism more than Marxism. I, I don't think Marxism gets you very far in Cuba anymore. Which is, you know, interesting. It would be a really interesting Cuban analysis, an, an interesting analysis to look at the, na you know, the National Party paper since, you know, the revolution. Just see how the rhetoric has changed over time.
Um, and I think the, the leadership understands you're not going to get anywhere on the basis of Marxism. Uh, and so nationalism is, you know, they, they can do a better job of lo getting loyalty from that. There we go. Um, so I'll pass the mic here, and then we have two questions online if we have enough time to get those answered. Thank you. I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about race and the way in which Cuban political mobilization in the U.S. might be reifying and in some ways like combining Cuban white supremacy with American white supremacy to exacerbate inequality on the island. So I grew up in Miami in the 90s, and for most of us, Cubans... And Argentinians, if you didn't hear them speak, were interchangeable. And <laughs> that's because of the migrants that were allowed to come. The people right, who came sure. in the first wave and the second wave. Yeah. When you go to Cuba, that is not what Cuba looks like <laughs> at all. And so even the shift of policies to uh, family preferential policy, what does that mean for more and more white Cubans being able to migrate relative to Afro-Cubans? And how does that play out here and there? And, and what's the relationship then between... Cuban politics and broader um, pan-ethnic Latino politics in the U.S., where you have really Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and then everybody else when it comes to these issues of migration. Uh, the race issue is interesting, and I cannot, I'm not the, the most expert on uh, race issues in Cuba. Fascinating topic. Um, so, you know, what I would say, first of all, you know, the immigration is highly racial, racialized. Um, and I think it continues to be, and partly it is how you define race, okay? So, the, the, you know, the first wave were really elites and middle class. And, but still, if you look, look at most Cubans who come, uh, depending on how you de define the palette, um, they're not heavily on the dark, darkest side of, of, of the spectrum. And you have to ask why. Why would they not be coming? Because there are, as you say, there are a lot of Afro-Cubans in Cuba, particularly in the eastern part of the country. It, part of it goes back who, to who came initially. And, and particularly then when family reunification, for those who come up with authorization, uh, you know, if you, if you didn't, if the, if the Afro-Cubans did not come immediately, uh, you know, select numbers did, it's not zero, but by and large, highly, highly underrepresented. And then that means, in terms of family reunification and claiming for, in, in, for legal immigration, you don't stand much of a chance because you're so low down in, in, in the totem pole. So um, it is making, I think, a difference, making the U.S. population more... Cuban population are more white. But, you know, the elite probably don't think they're white enough. You know, they, and so they, they start, I mean, the Mariel exodus was defined as, you know, this was a, a dark, you know, the new immigrants from Cuba. I, I, if you look at the U.S. Census, which is, uh, you know, how you identify yourself, the percentages went down to maybe 80% defining themselves as white in 1980 as opposed to 97% in before that. But 80% still is a lot, right? But I think for the older Cubans, that's too many, right? So there is definitely racism uh, among, I mean, you know, I don't mean to be critical, but I think there are racial issues among the Cuban-American population. They brought that with them. Uh, it's not a, a U.S. Con uh, invention. The U.S. probably it, it reinforces uh, those racial biases, but they, they did exist in, in, in Cuba already before their time. So uh, now, uh, partly you, but I think an uh, earlier question, I was struck that one of the Proud Boys, or the founder of the Proud Boys, was a Cuban-American which said, you know, I don't know how much of it is, is idiosyncratic. You know, there's always the individual element, but there's another element, and I think, oh, my gosh, you can see where this is coming from. So it may be both, you know, a little idiosyncratic, but there was a social base for, for, him, for him emerging. So uh, the other things, there's not, I don't know, and you may know more uh, from your experience in Miami or elsewhere, 
there's not that much of alliances between Cubans and other uh, Latinx, uh, well, what's that, what's it? Latinese, it was the, la the latest one I saw, uh, to get around these issues of Latinx, Latin, et cetera, so Latinese, um, that there is not that much unity. Uh, again, it's not zero, but the Cubans, partly they see themselves as different, and they live among themselves. They live, many of them, many of them, particularly the older ones, live in the highly uh, Cuban-American communities. Uh, a bit less so, I think, with some of the newer immigrants, but still. So I, I see the Cuban identity still is very strong, particularly among the, those who are politically active. So a lot of the newer immigrants are not politically active. Maybe they will be, but you know, they come from, they grew up in a Cuba without real politics other than official kinds of politics. So I don't know. I mean, when I started to look at the background of politicians, I didn't do a complete sampling. I never found anybody who came 1980 or since. Um, so at least to date, they are not becoming politically active or at least in those kinds of politics. So it's a very interesting thing. You would think there, there would be some fluidity be, with other immigrant groups that will change this um, and partly maybe take racial tones to it. But so far, the white supremacy thing seems to be stronger than the pro-black uh, pro kind of movements. Uh, interesting question. Do we have time for a couple of questions from the online? Yeah, if you do, Susan. Do you have time for two more questions? Uh, I'm, I'm, I have nothing to do. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Do <laughs> Wonderful. So one of our participants online would like to know if you came across Iranian migrants and or foreign policy in Iran after, your, after or during your research. Uh, do you know if there's any connections between the Cuban and the Iranian story in the late 20th century? No. I mean, I don't know, and I'm happy to learn. But I'm, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to. I mean, there were third world solidarity types of things. I don't know if that's what they're getting at. Or just, you know, because both are enemies of the, of, of the United States, so there's some solidarity. But I don't see it as a, as the Iranians as a big force in Cuba. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then our second question, um, they said, hello. They said, thank you so much for coming to speak. Um, this individual grew up in Miami, surrounded by Cuban friends in a time of changing politics in the city in that group. Uh, they said many Cubans they knew moved from Democratic to Republican alignment. And they wonder if you can speak about how politics alignment in the early days of their immigration may have changed. No, that, that's really interesting. And in my book on Cuban immigrants, the uh, immigrant divide, I do go into that particular issue. And so, and you know, Americans think, oh, the Cubans are conservative. So, of course, they're aligned with the Republicans. But it is true, the first Cubans who came here that went into politics went into a Demo the Democratic Party. So Lincoln Diaz-Balart, who is the older bar brother of Mario Diaz-Balart, who is a congressperson now in, in uh, South Florida, Lincoln was, was the first, uh, preceded him, his older brother. And he, who was, you know, was, uh, shares all these views on Cuba, et cetera, uh, with all the other uh, members of Congress who are Cuban-American, well, he entered politics as a Democrat uh, at the same time as, let's say, um, Bob Menendez in New Jersey, which was the second largest Cuban-American enclave initially, uh, went into the Democratic Party. Well, how come? They share the same views. Why did one become a Republican and one become a Democrat? Well, one was located in Florida and one was located in New Jersey. Northern New Jersey, very dead. It's dominated by the Democratic Party, so instrumental. And, and so, as I said, on anything related to Cuba, Menendez votes with the South Florida uh, Republican uh, members of Congress. So what happened, um, and I discussed it in my book, The Immigrant Divide, I believe it was under uh, Reagan, that you had a massive shift of Cuban Americans from uh, the Democratic to the Republican Party, and I have some statistics on it. So it was strategic, you know, they were courted by the Reagan administration, and so they shifted to the Republican Party. 
So a lot of politics is just instrumental. I don't think it was they had an aha moment in changing their ideologies. Um, and also the most concern to them was Cuban issues. So those just went with them if they went to the Republican Party. And they are shifting, actually, if, if you look at recent periods. I, I actually thought that the Cuban-American community was becoming more democratic, because almost half of them voted for Obama in, my, in Miami, and, over, I know, and about the same number, I think even slightly more, voted for Hillary. And you know, I, at first I thought it was an Obama effect, you know, that he's just an exceptional. Um, but it, it went through with Hillary as well. But then, since then, the Republicans have gotten an increasingly larger vote again of the Cuban-American vote. So it's not stable in that sense in terms of party loyalty, party loyalty. And I guess partly it depends on the issues, so who's, who's courting them and how. Uh, I, the Republicans also got um, this musician, somebody from Miami, help me, it begins with an o, o, Ovalo. O, he immigrated a few years, maybe by now, more than a few years ago from Cuba, Otavalo, something like that. Uh, I've got it written. Yes. I just wanted to follow up on the question online about Iran. Is that possible? Okay, well, let me just finish this and then we can get, get back to that. So, um, anyway, the Republicans have courted some uh, popular musicians in the Cuban American community who use their media, et cetera, their followings, and taken po political stands and brought uh, Cubans to, uh, to vote for Trump. So, you know, it's not just stable politics, I would say. It just depends on strategic issues and who's, who's courting them and how. So. I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, so speaking of Trump, I think this is a question that I think it's Ida Yalze has online, which is about whiteness. So Iranian Americans, some of them who prefer to call themselves Persian, have an investment in whiteness. And so it's, is there a similarity here among Cubans and Cuban Americans in whiteness? I mean, if you think about the Proud Boy example, for instance, right? Is there any parallels that you might see here? Uh, so the issue is? An investment in whiteness. They see themselves as white. Yeah. Definitely, the, the, you know, there's no better evidence than this, the uh, uh, census, which shows what uh, the high percentage of Cubans who identify as white. That's how you're defined by race in, uh, in the census, is it's self-identification. Self and the, the number who identify as white is extremely high and remains high. It's not that 97% that it used to be. but probably around 80% or something like that. So being white is very much part of the Cuban identity. Is that why, I'm sorry, I've always been curious about this. Is that why there's a Hispanic white and, and non-white that's always been a sense? Is that something Cubans in particular that that was created, or is that, do we know? You know, I, I am sorry to say I'm not a historian of the census, so well, I can't. That, that was before. Uh, Mora has a book on making that talks about the creation of the question. It was field tested in the 70s uh, and then used fully in the census in the 1980s. So it precedes some of these things. Um, but it is meant to differentiate an ethnic group different from race. So you're supposed to answer both questions. And right. so like what you can trace is exactly this, right? Like do you mark Hispanic and white or do you mark Hispanic and other or, or some kind of permutation of those? I, I know we're, we're supposed to be out of here. <laughs> okay, there's one more or no? Oh, no, we're good. Okay, all right. Well, all right, then I, then I, I want to, if you could join me in thanking Professor Eckstein um, for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you.